gives a new lease of life for 215 inmates at the Lyoko prison. A transition from convicts to graduates, a step closer to rehabilitation facilitated through education, a proof of how our jails can be transformed into reform centers. Natasha Perry has more. It's a dream come true for Carl Cravenstein. He has spent several years working towards this day. Okay, well, the first degree I got was a BSc IT degree in data management. My second degree was an honours degree in uh, information systems. And now my last degree is a master's degree in information systems. People from outside, people from prison, from everywhere, they came encouragement. So I'm very happy in that. In jail for the past 13 years, Carl now holds a master's in information and has graduated at the top of his class. He is one of the 215 inmates to graduate in diverse fields of study through the Department of Correctional Services Rehabilitation Program. Preparation comes in very many forms, but then we have come to know that education is the best tool for anybody who, is in a, who wants to prepare himself for the future. So if they could have a special fund that they avail to the inmates to make it possible for them to pursue their studies, I think then the biggest hurdle would have been crossed. With their friends and families looking on, the men and women took to the stage too much applause. One by one, they collected their qualifications, their ticket to rehabilitation. Will this mark the beginning of a new phase in their lives? A life away from stigma, a second chance. We are trying to contribute towards the mandate of, 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 of the country for, for to, 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 to make sure that we rehabilitate the inmates so that uh, once they are being um, uh, released, they might be in a position or they will be in a position to start the, their own lives. One can only hope that this sense of accomplishment goes a long way in maybe not erasing the past but going forward into the future. One lesson that needs to be learned from these offenders who just graduated is that true success does not come easy. Whilst they've achieved a huge accomplishment within their lives, only one question remains. Will society embrace them? For ANN 7 News, I'm Natasha Piri, Lokop, Johannesburg. In studio, I'm joined by Robert Mulefe, facilitator and ex-offended Kulisa Social Solutions, uh, Sean Victor, Social Work Supervisor, National Institute for Crime Prevention and the Reintegration of Offenders, NICRO. Manilisi Wolela, spokesperson of the Department of Correctional Services, also joins me in studio now. And we'll be speaking to Stanley Han um, Hankerman, rather, Senior Head, Building an Inclusive Society, Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. And we'll, and we'll be speaking to Stanley via Skype in a moment. We saw in studio. Very good evening to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Let's start with you, uh, uh, Mr. Manelisi Walela. Correctional services must be very proud about what we saw today at Lyokop uh, Prison and uh, many, many, uh, 215, in fact, uh, convicts graduating as well. Is uh, studying becoming a more popular uh, trend within our correctional services, but more importantly, what happens once they are free? Wonderful. Thank you so much for the opportunity. First of all, the graduation that we had in Gauteng in Lyukop is part of the Corrections Week, which we're using to showcase best pockets of excellence within correctional services. So we have a series of activities every day to showcase those pockets of excellence about what is being done and what is good inside correctional services. Because the bulk of the people outside there still regard prisons as purely black holes where people are dumped in and they are taken out as dangerous criminals. Yet we are making significant progress, particularly since the adoption of the white people in corrections in 2005. Of course there's still a long way to go because although we may have increased even the full-time schools from one in 2009 to 14 currently, full-time schools for offenders, they have increased from one to 14 over the last five to six years. There's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Sean, w what happens though for uh, former offenders, ex-convicts, when they get out into society, they often complain about the fact that nobody wants to hire them because they have criminal records. Is that perhaps not a big part of the problem that uh, may eventually lend them back into prison? Unfortunately, unemployment in South Africa is a huge crisis. Um, that coupled with 
a criminal record leads to disastrous effects. And I think that's why education is so important, especially imparting knowledge on entrepreneurship and then also skills in which someone can actually start their own business so that they aren't reliant on finding a job in the normal job market, but actually starting their own business or doing something as a trade that they can do from home, for example. Mm -hmm. So it really is important because education is one of the ways in which we can actually stop what we call the revolving door into prison. Mm -hmm. In terms of, uh, I suppose, can we make a, a correlation between lack of education or being poorly educated and then uh, finding yourself in prison? Uh, a lack of education has been identified by several research studies and criminologists as one of the greatest risk factors in um, leading a life of criminal activity. So there is definitely a strong correlation. Um, and also if you look at the studies that have been conducted, there's also a strong correlation between education within a correctional facility and then a reduction in recidivism. Mm -hmm. Robert, tell us about your, your story. You're an ex-offender as well, but now uh, life has changed for you. Yeah, I, I would say life has changed and, and something that Sean has said, like uh, for employment, it's very difficult to get employment, even although uh, for South Africans it's difficult. But what, what I've noticed is like if you're having a criminal record and then you've got skills, like the other people have graduated, to be a, an IT, who's going to employ that person? And for me, on my side, I, I will say uh, prison has taught me a lot. Uh, because while I was in prison, I never went to study. I was doing gangsterism, I was doing drugs. But by the last time when I have to go outside, and that's where I started to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I will say the change that came. I think it was all about age, because by then I was still a teenager. By the time I was going to release, I think I was 24 years. So mentality, I was by by strong, and then I was thinking about the people who were surrounding me. When you saying that you were involved in gangsterism while you were in prison? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, what what changed when you were when you were a free man? Uh, I will say uh, in prison, like for instance. Uh, I told myself, like, when I'm going outside, I'm not going to do crime. And then if I don't want to be in prison, first of all, I have to stop drugs. Mm -hmm. So that means I stopped drugs on the last day when I was going out from prison. Was that a personal decision or did the support come from the, the, the prison itself, from correctional services? Personal. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But that isn't the case, though, uh, Manilisi, for all convicts, is it? For those who don't receive the support, are they likely to find themselves back into correctional services? You know, for example, when we were launching our Corrections Week campaign in Durban at Commercial Christian Centre, the Chief Deputy Commissioner, Mr. James Smallberger, said very clearly, I think he was also interviewed by the media, he said, we can create opportunities. You can take a horse to the river, and, but the horse is not going to drink if that horse has decided not to. So what is important is that, as the White Paper says, we must even promote the, the programs we are providing to offenders to make use of. And we're increasingly building our capacity to give as much access as possible. We have an example here. We're talking about Houting only, if we're talking about 215 that we're graduating today in, in Lukop, it's Houting only. But that program is taking place all over the country. We're encouraging people to get involved. Some of them are still not getting involved inside. That's why we are even strictly now considering when people are going to be considered for parole. Those people that have not participated in this thing will stay inside and finish their, their, their sentences inside because we've got to have demonstrated evidence of willingness to change and real change so that because that thing limits the chances of committing crime again when they go outside. So that was, that's what is critical. And if you take note of, the, of what we're doing, over the past few years, three, four years, we've trained over 10,000 in technical skills which is plumbing, motor mechanic, engineering, electrical engineering, you name them. Because what happens is that in South Africa we have a serious skills mismatch. So if you're going to continue to train people in generic studies, while in fact the market outside demonstrates that those people without criminal records are thousands and millions outside unemployed, you're wasting your time. So that's why there's a, a, a paradigm shift in the manner in which you are dealing with these issues. With the support of, for example, the National Skills Fund, mm -hmm. which gave us about 60, 66 million. So it's part of that 66 million which was added to our the money we got from fiscals to be able to make that advancement to enable over 10,000 to access these critically needed skills by the bulk of the industry outside. Let me bring in Stanley into the discussion as well from the uh, Institute for Justice and 
reconciliation. Stanley, good evening and thank you very much for your time. It, it is great that uh, convict inmates are getting qualifications. It's needed. Education is important. But I'm sure there's someone asking the question, though, uh, if you were arrested for, for rape, for murder, does that necessarily mean that uh, you, can, you, you have, of course, uh, transformed? Okay. All right, uh, it seems I've, I've lost uh, my Skype guest. We'll try to get uh, Stanley Hankerman back uh, from the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. But Lisa, it, it, the same question to you about uh, the crimes that have been committed by perhaps some of the 215 who graduated today and many others as well. It's good and well you have a new skill, but can we truly trust and believe that uh, you are a changed person? Yes. Look. I think we need to, need to make a very clear differentiation between educational and development programs which they were graduating for here, as well as interventions that are aimed at correcting the offending behavior, what we call criminogenic factors that lead to crime, which are to a large extent individual. We are addressing two elements, both the criminogenic factors which are more or less individual factors, as well as socio-economic factors which are about education. Because offenders that are inside of our facilities, you've got about 85, 80-85% of offenders inside our facilities are coming from LSM 1 to 4. That's terrible. It's a macro issue of the economy and South African society. Number two, 35,000 inside our facilities don't have even grade 9, standard 7. What are you going to do in the world without Standard 7? 6,000 of them do not have, can't even read or write. You know, that's the kind of situation that we're facing inside. So definitely we have these social intervention development programs which are leading to graduation. But on the other side, we have 11 what we call corrections programs, which are about anger management, gender studies, you name them, all those things, which are about you understanding yourself within the broader society, societal context. Mm -hmm. So there are two. But unfortunately, we don't have graduation ceremonies for that one because it's more individual focused. Mm. Sean, Sean, you're nodding in agreement? Yes, definitely. Um, I think it's very important to take note of the fact that because we're working with individuals here, it's impossible to guarantee that anyone um, is completely re rehabilitated. Uh, that being said, I think there should be a strong link between uh, formal education as well as the rehabilitation um, interventions that offenders do undergo. And rehabilitation is something that is very personal. It is something that needs to be decided upon by that individual. Mm -hmm. And as was said, um, there are different factors that lead people to commit crimes. Um, there are individual factors, family factors, um, as well as community and work factors. Mm -hmm. So it's important to link education with interventions in order to try and ensure that someone is fully rehabilitated. Mm, certainly. Let's hear from some of these uh, inmates. Of course, our reporter Natasha Pierre was there this afternoon. And let's hear how their lives have changed through, uh, th through the education provided through the correctional services. The rehabilitation programs. Um, correctional services are trying their best to ensure that we um, do not reoffend, re that we will have, go outside and have a, a, live a better life. The rehabilitation process yeah, is, is, is happy. If you yourself yeah, you want to, to change, but if you don't, then uh, it's just up to an individual what you want. I think they can do more. I really appreciate what they have done so far, but I really think they can do more in terms of making the environment more conducive for students to study because there are certain hiccups we face uh, and it makes it difficult for some to endure to this level. Hmm. Let's go back to you, Robert, as well. You said uh, it was a personal decision that you took to lead a better life as well, but how did you uh, get yourself into prison? Uh, I committed a lot of crime. I, I went to crime because of committing murder and robbery and escape from lawful custody. Um, for the question that you ask if people who did the ro uh, rape and robbery they are able to change, I'm one of them, that's an example. And the other thing you'll find out, like, typical example, with the employers around there, you'll find out they've got crime, but they've never been caught. So I would say for me, it started by me, like I sit alone, because most of the time I was committing crime even in prison. I was breaking the office of the prison orders to steal the drugs inside. Mm -hmm. So, but along the way I found out like I need to change, but how, where, and how? Mm -hmm. If you don't have that support, you don't know. Like it then came the Kulisa's, Kulisa Social Solution. Even although I joined because of Borromi and 
were mixed with the male offenders. So that's the thing put me through. But it started with me because I wanted to change. And then who I can turn to to help me? There was no one. By the time when it goes, there was a social worker and then he told me about the program and then I joined the program. How much time did you do behind bars? I did four years, one month, uh, from the 22 years. I was acquitted the 17 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Calls are coming in. Luyolo, you're in Cape Town. Good evening. Hello. Yes, Luyolo. Uh, yes, yes, Luyolo speaking. I just want to find out in terms of um, example, you, um, they do get sent to all these courses and so forth. They study, they get the degree. What then at the end? Because um, once you come back to... Um, broader society in terms of things like employment and so forth on, um, one of the prerequisites in most jobs that you, that you tend to apply to as an individual, um, you need to be, uh, to have no criminal record whatsoever. So now I'm just wondering.